or anxiety, it might um, be wrong in which your approach is. So basically, you know, stress is a response to a daily pressure or a threatening situation, while anxiety is a reaction to the stress. So what does that mean in brief? I know we got, I'm just trying to go, we got so much meat to deal with here, but what does that mean? So let's say we have a competition. Let's say, you know, my daughter is an athlete and she's a student athlete and, and she was looking at the Junior Olympics and she was looking at the times and why do every athlete look at the marks, results, or times? I mean, I mean, I did it, but why? You know, just to get yourself stressed out. I mean, well, they're running this and they're running that. Well, I said, why'd you look? But be, and then that just adds to the just depression and this anxiety and the stress. But how do you deal with that? So let's talk about some of the features that we can do with my. Okay, most of the time when you ask somebody, what do they say? I'm fine. Everybody's fine. How you doing? I'm fine. You know, depending on what culture and what ethnic background, some of the times, most of the times, in certain cultures, to acknowledge. Um, fear, depression, or weakness is considered a failure, considered a sign of weakness. So you have to be careful when you're dealing with different cultures and cultural backgrounds to understand their upbringing. So you just won't um, deal with the I'm fine response because all of us say we're fine, but in essence, we're not. And that's what leads to it. Another one is self-perception. How do you perceive yourself? And as a coach, how do you perceive your athletes? You know, are you, which one do you, are you the small one or the, the big dog? Because you'll gravitate towards your current, you know, your thoughts. And it doesn't matter the size of the dog, it matters what the size of the heart and the dog. So look at this picture. If you have a superstar athlete as a coach, your self-perception of them and yourself is going to be great. If you have an athlete that does not fit that, you know, high level, top of the line, then how do you feel? One of the most detrimental things as coaches as we can do is have the athletes depend and convince us rather than us supporting and convincing them. So many times as coaches, we make the mistake of, you know, we see their performance, especially on competition day, and what do we do? The based on how they look, that we have confidence. I remember one time I was, we was just at the world championships and, and I was in Stuttgart, Germany and I was going over some hurdles. For those you don't know, I, I can't say. Yeah, there was a voice, okay. And I went over there and the coach said to me, you know, um, he looked at his time and said, are you okay, are you ready? And I'm like, well, you tell me, <laughs> am I ready? You know, and so many times as coaches, we have to convince. I hear it, I hear it. I remind the, I can hear you guys. So if you guys want to mute, but every time it's, 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 it's where our job as coaches and parents is to convince, to instill confidence in the athlete, not the athlete's performance, instill confidence in us. And so many times that's where the pressure and the stress of the athlete comes in at because we feel like we have to convince our coach that we're ready and then he'll be happy. And, and, and that's not what the whole game of sport is all about. So basically, your self-perception, and I'm going through this. The biggest challenge we have as athletes and coaches and parents like is fear. And we would be all lying if we say we weren't. Fear of being last in the competition, fear of defeat. And most of the time, fear of success. They are a faith. The five fatal factors of fear, and I'll just share this with you quickly. If you guys can see it, it's the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, the fear of the unknown, the fear of being wrong, and the fear of pain. And as coaches, some of the remedies that we can use is how do we offset that? Well, we got to implement what? If it's the fear of failure, we have to what? Implement a need to succeed. If it's um, the fear of rejection, we have to, a need to approve, approval, and so on and so forth. Fear of unknown, give them a sense of control. A fear of being wrong, you know, need to be right. Um, fear of pain, 
you need to feel comfort. Now, you guys are going to get a copy of this, and I'll show you the reference. But if you guys really study this and start inputting this into your program, it will really see their, your, your athlete and yourself for that matter. Bro. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would please make sure that your mics are on mute, if you don't mind. We greatly, greatly appreciate it. I saw right. she was American Nodeling. I thought she was. So basically, this is what to watch. Okay. Now, how do we uh, identify what these mental illnesses are? This is very important, especially in competition. And I'm biased towards the sport of track and field, but this goes across the board. You know, what is to watch for? Well, if we got abrupt or drastic change in eating habits or sleeping patterns, especially in different sports and um, and women and for as uh, bulimic and whatnot, you have to make sure that if they're saying, I'm not going to eat because I want to lose weight, make this weight, or uh, I'm not going to eat anything, uh, that's problematic, problematic. And you guys should really, as coaches and parents, but as coaches, really monitor what they're eating and if there's a drastic change in their eating habit. Um, moodiness, anger, and swings. Now, we all get a certain disposition before a competition, but we're talking about those drastic mood swings where they almost are on the verge of violent um, that's really uncharacteristic, especially when it comes to hard practices or a days leading up to a competition and on that day of competition. Um, of course, the social media, caring about what people think, looking at their results or looking at everybody else's results. Um, increased tearfulness and our laughter. Um, many think depression is just sadness, but you can laugh like tears of a clown, if you will. You can laugh but still be hurting inside. So make sure if there's your overabundance of silliness or laughter or even sadness, that you monitor that and, and take control of that. Um, sudden lack of interest in sport, school, friends, or hobby. This is where you say, I quit, or I don't wanna play, or don't force me. This is normally what happens when children, when parents vicariously and coaches live through their, their children and they apply that pressure, which we'll talk about later on, but that pressure will, will cause them to uh, just turn around and rebel from the sport totally within itself. If you guys know anything about Michael Jordan, when he went to um, baseball, it wasn't just because he was born out, but it was just the pressure and the stress that he was going through and the expectations that society has. And he just said, I just need to break. And so he just you know, rebelled from the sport that he loved and got rejuvenated. Anything that feels out of the ordinary. Um, we always see symptoms after the fact. Um, high rate of suicide, a high rate of depression, but it's our job as coaches to be mindful of what we see and how we could um, offset the potentials. These are things to keep in mind when supporting a young athlete. You know, when we're dealing with mental health and counseling and, 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 and coaching, you know, what are the signs and what can we do? The first thing I want to share before we look at the screen is the difference, guys, between counseling, coaching, and we know what mental health is, but we hear all these terminologies. Um, what is counseling? What is coaching? What is mentoring? What is a uh, parking lot therapist, if you will? Well, it, it, in short, let me um, just summarize it like this. Co counseling is more dealing with your past, dealing with issues that um, there's cause and effect and counseling is more so dealing with the cause, dealing with a, something called pathology, your past, you know, a why did you get to where you are and what could we do? And you, meaning looking back, and I'm summarizing this, uh, but coaching is more so uh, dealing with the now and the future. Let's put together a game plan. So as coaches, your job is not to really counsel because in counseling, you need to be licensed, you need to be trained and you need to be credited. And I think that sometimes we get those things mixed up. If a child is experiencing some trauma or an athlete is experiencing some trauma, like they've been molested by, you know, one of their coaches or parents are abused. Well, a coach's job is not to counsel. Their job is to defer them or refer them rather to uh, professionals that can help treat 
the pathology, the history, because it's more traumatic than it is goal oriented. So I want you guys to make sure that when you're on the field or of play and you're dealing with these athletes and you're going through these mood swings, make sure you're able to discern the difference between this child needs counseling versus they need coaching. If they're complaining about not wanting to go home or afraid of when someone touches them or, or even if it's a teammate, then you have to discern, okay, is this something that's more traumatic and then maybe we can, I need to, and I always have resources, which leads me to the slide of building your support network for yourself. Um, one thing that I wanted this quick workshop to be about is uh, you, the sick can't help the sick. And a lot of us are coaches, but if we need help ourselves, it's gonna be hard to see signs of depression, anxiety, stress, if we are those symptoms ourselves. So we have to look within ourselves. It's sort of like the airplane theory, right? Put your own you know, face mask on before you put the other person's mask on. And I just want you guys to take a, a deep reflection in yourselves to see, um, is my um, network uh, built together? How am I dealing with the stress of coaching, the stress of life, the stress of parenthood, coaching, especially in this COVID, especially when the lack of field availability are, athletes going to other teams or underperforming or, you know, just all the stress that's going on with being a coach. How are you dealing with that? Do you have a support team? So build your network and your resources to not try to do it on your own and have, uh, you know, because you look at a couple of YouTube videos or read a couple of books. But as coaches, we all know that you can look at 50,000 YouTube videos on how to train, but until you're actually blowing the whistle and stopping the watch, it's totally different. So, um, have resources of mental health, uh, 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 you know, uh, professionals, even if it's a, a lay counselor, if you will, but something and someone that knows about mental health and the difference between stress, anxiety, and depression um, versus burnout versus compassion fatigue, just knowing these terms that they can help you um, find out what's um, going on with your athletes and, and what's going on with yourself. Secondly is don't ignore the warning signs so many times because we're, we have anxiety of coaches. We're going to ignore, ignore the anxiety of our athletes. I remember I was at the uh, junior Olympics and it was so chaotic. It was like 50,000 kids trying to all check in. And then you had the uh, coaches that did not <laughs> do their job good enough to feel like they can trust them to walk to the check-in so they have to walk with them right because they have anxiety they're nervous and they're projected out of the athlete and it was just so chaotic and you've seen these children some of them were just standing there in shock not necessary for their competition just in shock about whatever was going around them and their coach was screaming and go do this and they're trying to warm up and their coach is screaming from the sidelines because you can't get in with the athletes and oh, do your high knees and like it was just so uh saddening to see the stress and the anxiety that these children was being put through remember they're wet cement these kids are being put through because the coaches were not able to maintain their you know emotional intelligence or their maturity or their you know um, 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 anxiety levels and which is problematic so please you could be the greatest dentist, but you can't give yourself a root canal. So, you know, make sure you make sure you have your resources to make sure that your mental health and your anxiety and pressure of life is 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 um, under under wraps as well. Thirdly, take a break. You know, this whole mental illness and coaching can be all consuming. Take a break to understand that you know there's a word called compassion fatigue, and this is more psychological terms or the self care uh, health care industry but uh, burnout and compassion fatigue is is, is when uh, you know burnout is when you're just tired of the sport or tired of the uh, occupation but compassion fatigue is when you're empty when you haven't given yourself enough love so you're giving and giving and giving and giving and giving especially in coaching in the care field you're giving and giving and giving but you're not replenishing it so you have 10 oranges and you get, gave all 10 oranges away but you're thirsty and you're hungry and how are you going to get your you know nourishment so make sure that you uh, take time and take a break from trying to be um super coach or super parent because you know you need the break as well um and that leads to getting counseling if you feel any of this and, and let's 
understand the stigma and they have something now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, called mental health coaching, which again is a form of counseling, but it's not going into um, being able to diagnose you or being able to you know, label you with depression because those are trained to licensed individuals. Um, and so if you're a psychologist, you can do that or a counselor, you can do that. Um, but if you're a, just a coach, you can't say, well, I think you're depressed. No, you can refer them to someone that can say that. Um, and, and your opinion is just that, your opinion, but it's not based on any you know, education or, or, or training. So make sure that you get your counseling as well and develop a strategy for handling this unusual behavior. How do you handle it? How do you deal with what's going on? And next time we get together, we're going to have some coping skills because I wanted to spend a whole 30 minutes dealing with these coping skills to get these athletes to perform like they do in practice on the field. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have as coaches at practice, they look great. At practice, they're, you know, while they're breaking records. But then when they get in the meet, things, something changed. They get that anxiety, they get tight, or they seem like they forget. <laughs> what, what do we just work on? But these are some skills that we can do to offset that. And not to have this as a depressing, but there are some benefits um, of, you know, being an athlete. And as you see, it, creating an active living habits, you know, and setting goals and social support and, you know, forming your values and all this stuff. But these are some benefits, you know, active kids that are in this. We are, you know, enabling these kids to what? If you look at this chart, I don't know if you can see it, one out of, of 10 is likely to be a beast, but that decreases as they are youth athletes building yourself up to uh, college athletes and um, higher self-esteem, if it's done correctly, uh, lower health costs, lower health habits, you know, um, one third the rate of disabilities. All these are the, the benefits that they have just as a human being. And then the, for their community, you know, um, having to persist, um, just look at the, you know, having higher than average, you know, air quality index. What does that mean? The way they breathe, you know, their bad breath, just kidding. Higher than average bike and walk scores, higher property value, just higher graduation rates, just the things that we're doing as coaches and parents and supporting these kids and AAU and other sports and organizations. And it's instrumental in the, you know, contribution to the society that we're dealing with. And um, so I just want to encourage you guys to, um, in a nutshell, to sell it all up, parents and coaches are encouraged to com you know, comment on an athlete's attitude, effort, rather than their performance. So many times we are performance driven as adults that we forget that children aren't held by the same criteria. So we wanna see how fast you're running and we give a pat on the back or an acknowledgement when their performance is good, but we wanna make sure that their attitude is good and their effort is good and that their integrity is good because we are developing these kids and the pressure that they are under now to succeed. As coaches, we need to redefine what that word success truly means. What I deal with my athletes or go around, you know, you know, with my clients, I don't deal, I don't measure success by their performance. I measure success by their attitude, by their effort. And, and so if you guys, and I know we all want to win, but there's only one spot at number one, but there's a lot of spots on being a winner. So if we can train our, ourselves to understand that there's only one gold, silver, and bronze. Yeah, I was blessed to have, what, two of those six medals, you know, in eight, eight years, but everybody else is still a winner. And we have to be able to pull that out, especially develop that within our children and within our athletes, because that can come to depression, uh, suicide, um, quitting, and we do not want to be part of the problem. We want to be part of the solution. I just wanted to. Um, this is a resource. This is a book that you know that I wrote in the zone: how to overcome the hurdles of life and succeed. How to find, get, stay in the zone. This is something that you guys need to pick up on my website, Mark Career. But I think that whatever you do, get some resources that can speak to what I am saying 
and not just in like, 25 minutes, but also, you know, it's going to take uh, just like you're working physically with your athletes, you need to work mentally with your athletes because I train my athletes, not just physically, but mentally at the same level. So when they're at a championship, their physicality is not here, but their mental ability is here. They're not going to perform. So you want to do it at the same time, just like speed and endurance, if you will. So make sure you guys get a hold of some resources that you guys could you know, speak to. But hopefully we've discussed what is mental health, what are the common causes, and there are some things that we can do to um, offset it, to prevent it, and to be aware of it. And the next time, this might be more geared towards the athletes. How do I do it? You know, coach, they say, coach, I'm nervous. I'm scared. Um, I know what's in me. I just start thinking too much. You know, a lot of athletes think too much. I did the visualization. I did the closing of my eyes. But as leaders, I just wanted this first part to be uh, more important for us to understand. So when they come at you with those questions, we'll have a, a library of resources and proper training to get these kids out of that um, state and get them performing to the best of their abilities. Thank you so, so much, everyone. You can give your emoji hand claps to Dr. Creer for tonight's talk. Um, before we go into our Q&A, um, I do wanna ask just a couple of questions and hopefully you can give us some of your, uh, that, some of your coach career uh, okay. advice for this. Um, the first question I have, and we, we touched on both of these a, a bit, um, but how would you particularly um, imp implement and how would you how would you let another coach know how to implement mental health training into the daily workout routine? I know for myself as a uh, as a former track coach, track athlete, and now coaching and speaking to women's sports teams, I do lots of visualization. I, I have them uh, think of their life outside of sports. I, I create a story that they that will be basically guided that will help them see themselves winning mm. in all facets of life. So that's just one thing that I particularly do. What would you do and what would you suggest to another coach um, how to implement that mental health training? Well, I think that from day one, I mean, just like, you know, there's a thing, I call it, it's the macro and micro. You've all heard of that when it comes to training, but you have to implement it from the beginning. And just like you do your fall program, your mind is a muscle, the brain is a muscle, and you have to train your brain as well. Most of the athletes and most of the coaches, we just work on our physical aspect. But then we'll say that uh, competition and athletics is 90% mental. Well, how come you don't work on that? So we're talking about drills at practice, mental drills that, you know, that whole book. And, you know, we, we will be here another 10 hours talking about that, but just mental drills to go along with your physical drills, positive reinforcement, positive coaching, um, being able to have them, you know, educate you more than you're educating them. Our job is to coach, but they should be coaching us at the same time. So what do you think you did right on that one? Well, I should have, I could have done better on this. Let them educate. That's stimulating the brain. That's teaching them to think for themselves, which in essence, they're going to have to do on the playing field. If you're just enabling that behavior by just, you know, telling them all the time, then they're going to be one of those athletes. I call them the price is right athletes. You know, the price is right athletes. They're always looking at the audience and, you know, when they got to do their thing, right? So I think that from day one, I have a program where we implement, you know, just little mental health muscle memories, mental health drills, but you have to implement it at the same time you're doing your program. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And then secondly, this is again, part of the mental health training athletes deal with wins they deal with losses they deal with defeat they deal with victories they deal with not injuries soreness things that keep them out of competition or nervous in competition what would you do in the midst of practice or the midst of competition to help that athlete clear their mind and be ready to train and or compete well that's a good question but it's, it's, it's like this when 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 you're dealing with competition i think that 
but I'm giving it away, but it's all good because I think it's important. Competition, it should be the easiest, and this is what we do every day, should be the easiest day of the week. You only do in your event once or twice. I was tell, I tell my athletes, you're only running 100. At practice, we run three or four and five 150s and, you know, four 200s or whatever your workout is. So, again, it's putting less pressure and less, less emphasis on this is the big moment. Because we all know, you know, when you think big, then you start trying to change things. So, to what I speak to them is like, there's nothing changed. This is just a routine but that we started from day one. And I think that it's important to start these things from day one, because what happens is people call me, Dr. Mark, Mark can you, you know, help my kid? Um, he's running tomorrow. Well, <laughs> you know how coaches, we those coaches, can we get those athletes, whether it's mental or physical, can you help them out? He has competition next week. Well, that's not going to be enough time, you know? So I think that we have to start again and let them know that if this is nothing, quit putting so much emphasis on the championship, and let's just talk about us performing and executing. It's what we're gonna focus on. And, you know, I got this thing called find, get, stay in the zone. And part of that is, you know, finding that zone. And we're not talking about the twilight zone. A lot of people are in that twilight zone, you know, but you gotta find that zone and then you gotta get in that zone and then you gotta stay in the zone. But this just muscle memory again, practice every day what we think there's life and death in the tongue. So many of us don't even realize that we're speaking death to ourselves. Oh, I, I, I was okay. All that is just doing push-ups. You're just doing mental push-ups. And right. then meet, meet day, you're gonna, you know, we re, 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 re back to what you practice. I like that. I like that. And this, again, today is mainly for our coaches. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll talk more with our, geared toward our athletes uh, next week. Uh, but I think it's really, really great to, to have coaches understand and know the importance of protecting our own mental health in addition to protecting the mental health of our athletes. That way the two can really be a cohesive unit. If we're both, I, I usually tell my, my clients, you know, you can't pour from an empty cup. So you have to fill yourself up and what you give to everyone else is the overflow, not from your cup so that you can continually fill yourself up and can, and can continually uh, give to those athletes on a daily, ba daily basis. Um, thank you so much audience for joining us. We're gonna go into Q&A. If you would like to put questions in the chat, you are very welcome to. You can also use the emoji reactions button to raise your hand and we will acknowledge you and you can unmute yourself. Um, we do have a uh, question from Edward. Uh, are tickets, are ticks something to be concerned about? So like a Tourette ticks. Well, it all depends. I mean, are we talking about something that's just happening or is something that only happens when it's competition or is something that is just, you know, a condition that is not just, is it just specific oriented or is this a, you know, a continual? Um, it's more of a nervous thing. It doesn't really manifest itself like before an event or during an event, it's usually like after an event, maybe it's his way of like unwinding, I'm not sure, but like his tick is, he'll like make sounds like, whoop, you know, just, he makes these just lots of sounds. <laughs> I was just curious if it's something that you've seen before. Or heard well, people respond, but again, I don't know if he's gotten counts. Can you mute yourself? I don't know if he's received counseling and if his ticks or any other, you know, post, you know, uh, rituals, if they're not uh, detrimental or harming himself and our others, then I wouldn't, you know, oh, we, we can't watch it in here. Rock I wouldn't pay attention to it. You know, but if it's something that he's doing that is causing bodily or emotionally or physically harm, then intervention is necessary. But if his parents haven't said anything and, he, and, he, and if he hasn't indicated that is is hindering his performance, maybe that's just his part of his warm down routine. Our warm up. I've seen people 
do a lot of different things, you know, <laughs> having headphones on and, you know, talking to themselves. But if it's not, again, detrimental, I don't want to go labeling and, and diagnosing someone for that type that might be part of his routine. Awesome. You're so welcome, Edward. I hope that that helped you. If you want us to elaborate, just let us know in the chat. Um, we have Akina Goodson with a question. Akina, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak to what Edward's question was, um, and maybe this will help. I have a son, he's a senior this year, and who runs track, and he has tics as well. It's his way of releasing the stress. When they get that stress builds up, and his tics start to well activate, they're more productive when he's stressed, you know, or in a stressful situation. And we realize it's just the nervousness that comes with getting ready to compete. And then mm -hmm. even afterwards, um, he's also high functioning autistic, but he does very well. This is his thing, right? So it's almost like their way, they kind of hold it in. And then once they're done, it just kind of releases. And then sometimes the chicks can be a mile a minute. His are not for the, they're not the vocal. They're mm -hmm. more like in his eyes. You know, his eyes will do the jumping thing and his nose will do like the little rapid thing. Um, so what we've seen is just that in the either beginning, during or after, usually after is when they're really high. And a lot of times they try to hide that from everybody else as well, which also causes it to be very strong afterwards. So it's kind of like a release of all that stress and anxiety that they were holding on to um, exactly. before and during competition. And not to bring so much attention to it, I think that, you know, um, try not to react. I think as parents and as coaches, we want to react, but if this is a way of them releasing or dealing with the stress and anxiety, um, then we can find, um, steps to help them better you know release it but i think that we shouldn't react to it in a way that will make them feel more you know uh, attract more attention to it i agree sorry i don't mean to interrupt do you mind if i share something not at all go ahead dr chalula thank you yes so i am a coach as well as a clinical psychologist and oftentimes so i work with kids with the autism and now we used to have some in the DSM-4 called Asperger's, but yeah. oftentimes with athletes, right? We, sometimes they tend to have tics and a lot of the times like, um, and it can be as an overload of stress and it's a way of dealing with their own stress. And a lot of the times providing comfort, support, encouragement, and that, that can help. So also like coping skills that we're probably gonna be talking about helps like doing breathing exercises, normalizing, mm -hmm. that really helps and sometimes um, I think for especially teens or children, they don't really know what's on, what's going on or even other people. So just like Dr. Mark is saying about just providing that support, that empathy and comfort, it can be, that's all we can do as, as coaches. Yeah, thank you. And not reacting to it. I think that part of the stress and anxiety is when we react to it in a, a negative way. And sometimes um, just like someone maybe you know, slipping or tripping, if we, you know, not react to it, but be maybe proactive and finding ways. But at that moment, trying to, you know, change them is sort of more hurtful than helpful. Do you have any more questions? Um, we do. Uh, we have uh, a few yeah. questions that have popped yeah. up. This is great. I'm so glad that you all are enjoying this. Uh, Cheryl Etheridge said, this should be a mandatory requirement to attend this class, just like Safe Sport. I agree. She says, great info. Um, Marie Claude Tremblay says, uh, any tips in dealing with stressed or angry parents? Sometimes I find that parents can be so hard on their kids. Mm -hmm. And well, quickly, Dr. Jose, is it Jose or is it Jose? Yes, Jose, yes. Uh -huh. Did you email me? Uh, I probably, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Someone did. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I'm digging that Erica Badu hat, by the way. Oh, LaShawn, you rock it, girl. I'm just, okay. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> now, y'all, you tell her, put the hands up. Okay. <laughs> I'm from LA, you know, you know. Anyway, so the question was, how do you deal with obnoxious parents? Stressed oh. and angry parents, yes. Which, yes, AKA, they those yeah. stressed and angry parents, if we all are being real with ourselves mm -hmm. in this room tonight, those oh, yeah. stressed and angry parents can become obnoxious parents mm -hmm. because it's they're they're passionate and they care, but in my opinion, it's I think they're caring about just the end result versus 
the maturation of the athletes See, this, while they are preparing for their sport, for their event. How do you deal with them by, by understanding that statistic wise, one out of every four individuals could be clinically diagnosed as some type of mental illness and they go undiagnosed. And the thing about mental health and mental illness is that unless you're doing bodily harm to yourself or a threat, we can use that terminology, uh, society and legal enforcement can't do anything about it. That's why when you see homeless or transit people, you don't intervene because when they come up and, and police officers or anyone talk to them, they communicate at that particular moment. So you, you can't do a 5150 or you can't do any type of code where you have to intercede because that's just their personality and a behavior that is hard to police. So you have to understand as coaches that uh, parents have issues too. And it has nothing to do with the sport. If it was anything else, they would be acting the same way. So you're going to have to learn some techniques of being, we call it the referee. You know how referees hear people talking and they don't really react or respond. You have to not react and respond because you have these coaches that have children and they put them in these other programs. And this is the biggest issue that I've come across is these knowledgeable parents. You know, I'm a coach, and but you, you send them on this club, but they're a coach. So they're going to be on the field or they're going to be giving you suggestions. Well, why don't you come in and coach then and I'll give you my kid, you know, but you have to have understanding that they're going through and you don't know what they're dealing with. And sometimes the playing field and the sport is those children's safe haven. There's something called trauma, complex trauma, all these type of traumas that there might be an escape route. So yeah, they see their parents being obnoxious, rude, overbearing, but just think what they have to deal with at home. Just think what they have to deal with on a ride home. So uh, as a coach, you have to understand that. And, you know, it kind of be that buffer because if they're giving you that much, uh, you know, resistance, what do you think they're giving a child on the way home? Right, right. Thank you so much for that. Jackie, why, and, and Marie, I hope that he helped with your question there. Um, Jackie White asks, if you have an athlete that is exhibiting some of these signs of severe sadness or laughter, crying, et cetera, if you're overly concerned but can't share with the parents, what are other alternatives? Well, the first question that would be, why can't they share with the parent? Unless the parent is part of the problem. If the parent is the abuser or, you know, then there would be problematic. And then as coaches, we are mandatory reporters. Why well, I know that I am. And, and so you have to discern whether this is a sign of abuse. And if you think it is, then you would maybe, you know, uh, I don't know about reporting, but you would bring some more attention. You would at least attempt to talk to the parents. And then if the parent's reaction is not, you know, receptive or it might be violent, then you take it to the next level but you don't want to be held accountable for knowing something and not saying something because, you know, it's what do they say to know something and not saying anything, you're just as responsible. So I think that you would try to communicate, find out why, and then go to the next step. And you should have protocols within your bylaws or protocols in your program to say, Hey, if we see, and this is what is now being implemented. If we see, certain behaviors we're not running to the authorities we got to understand the culture the background we're going to make every effort to see if we can help remedy this situation by communicating to the parents or another significant other but the main objective is to get relief to the child so it might not be running to authorities but th these children may run to you for that safe haven and you have to be ready to again be that you know comfort not counselor but you can, you know, console, but there's a difference between consoling and counseling. And you have to know the difference between that so you won't be enabling and, but you'll be able to help get them the, you know, help that they need. I, I agree. I, I also would like to add to that. Um, sometimes the parents don't know how to ask, how can mm -hmm. I help? How can I, how can I support the team? How, you know, they want to support their child. And in the grand scheme of it all, they really just want to be a part of something. They want the to good be, ones. They want <laughs> the, the good ones. And, and even the stressed ones, the stressed ones, angry ones. They need a hug. 
they 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 want to know they want to to be asked how are you doing just as much as we want to ask our athletes how are you doing see that's the challenging part though that's the challenging part because our job as coaches is to deal with the athletes and not you know there's a difference between coaching and consoling and some of these parents want consoling yeah they want that but then our job is to you know make sure so like i said if you don't have enough supporting staff then you'll get burnout then right. you'll be one five so you just make sure that you know yeah i can talk to you but there's rules i got a rule and i'm sure coaches you know it's funny because track and field is so different than football or basketball basketball you can have all the opinions in the world but they're just that your opinion and you're going to say those opinions in the bleachers but in track i've seen parents go on a field go on and practice it's just amazing how I think, but when you're creating your program to put these policies in place that says we, we respect it, if you, these are certain times that you would have a conversation. Um, a lot of clubs have mandatory volunteering so they can be a part. So it's just a matter of them adjusting and being, and, and you teach people how to treat you. So it's right. just having a, a foundation that they realize that I can't get away with that, with this program. Right. I think it's also important, like like you you said, you know, give the parents something to do, mm -hmm. you know, make that a part of your protocol. So if I won't be around then, yeah, be and around see, then, see how many <laughs> are actually there to support the team, and 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 see how that does. If you give them a job, see see how they fulfill it. Uh, we have a question from. David Flint, uh, he has a track and field question. So we have some boys hiding out in the bathrooms, some who avoid the trainers when they need their help, general avoidance, even star sprinters. Boys tend to hold it in. Anyone else? Any advice is appreciated. Absolutely. I think that is a case. And Dr. Mark, if you would are we talking about hiding in a bathroom doing what? I'm like, what? So, so what I'm getting from the, and David, if you if you yeah, want they to they hide in the bathroom or hide in somewhere, I mean, what are they I'm doing looking, in the bathroom? I'm looking at this as if they're injured, if they're hurt, if there's something that they need attention with, but because they're star sprinters, because they're the okay, he replied after a so poor after a poor after a poor okay, that's clarification. Okay. So this is where, as coaches, our job is to be that safe haven. I keep saying that to have them, you know, you have to build trust and build that relationship. And if they're avoiding you, uh, then they're somehow, you know, afraid of the criticism, the chastisement or the rebuke that you may give them. And I'm not saying it's your fault. It could be their own conscience, but in their minds, you don't, you know, you want to be that bathroom. You want to be that corner that they go and hide to. And I think that that starts again with day one. So what advice we can give is uh, during, yeah, peer to peer. So what we can do is during meetings, during practice, we don't single out people. We sort of reinforce that. And you guys be surprised from day one, you know, we don't stand for criticism, you know, and just really make that part of your program. We all want to do guilt. We are going to do bad sometimes. Uh, don't single someone out. You know, you drop the baton. Things happen, but, you know, we're still good. We're still a team. You know, we everybody can do. Use the words we when it comes to criticizing. And then when it comes to, you know, uh, educating, then use the word I or you. It's be surprised when people don't want, you know, criticism. Don't use the word you. Don't single out. And I'm sure you don't. And then that will bleed into the culture of your team. A lot of people don't realize that. Well, he ran terrible. Man, you ran a split. You ran a 60-second split. And, man, we, okay. No, we can do better. We all could have done better. But at the same time, we're here. And let's be thankful. You know, you have to implement that positive coaching to give them a feeling that I'm not pleased, but I'm not angry at you. And there's a difference, you know, man, I'm disappointed that we didn't win, but I'm not angry at you. And I think there's peer pressure, but that comes with the culture and, and you know, hearing everybody else and other teams talking and whatnot. But if you give them that environment that is safe, then nine times out of 10, they'll start, you know, coming out of that bathroom, if you will. Mm -hmm. 
I also think going into that, uh, that type of relationship, it, there has to be a, if we're talking about athletes, coaches to athletes, you have to build that no like trust factor. So they <laughs> might know you because they see you around the campus or they know you because they know you're the coach, but they don't really know you. So humanizing yourself even more to your athletes really helps open the door up yeah. for them to then be able to start liking you and then once they like you they will trust you and they will they will start opening up like blossoming flowers I mean but definitely building that particular aspect of no like trust is imperative um, because it's it's that's when you'll start to see those signs those early signs and symptoms uh, a little bit more clearly let's see we we go in an hour and eight minutes i thought I, I, I tell you yeah, we eight. have we have some good questions in here now let's see it looks like we have one two three more questions okay. um so we'll stop after this third question from miss uh from adrian simmons uh john asks how would you go about helping an athlete who performs very well in practice and oh, workout but doesn't compete up to their potential in meat that is so frustrating. You know, you grab them and you yell at them. Just kidding. <laughs> like, what's wrong? No, you trick them. You say the meat day is practice or the practice day is the meat day or whatever. We used to have that. And that is one of the most challenging aspects as coaches. But I think that how you handle that specifically is by being, and, and there was another question about someone hiding to not to, to rest and not have to run a mile relay or something like that. It's all about your foundation. And as a coach, you're not just getting them to run faster. You're getting them to be, you're training young men and women if you're a youth. So it's that foundation. So, and, and how do you deal with, you have to every day in practice, you know, say, look, this is what, you know, execute. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. You know, and giving them that, freedom of making a mistake a lot of times we don't give our athletes or ourselves permission to fail permission to make a mistake so they're trying too hard so if you kind of lower the the the, uh, the expectations if you will this is how the mind works it's, it's pressure it's you know pressure it's like you running with a 50 pound weight on you versus running you know with no weights what are you going to do better and I think that for whatever reason, these athletes feel like when it comes to meet day, they're putting on that 50 pound weight vest. And it's our job to let them know that win, lose or draw, it's all good. And sometimes, you know, um, give them permission to fail, permission. So they won't put so much weight and pressure because they're thinking too much at practice, they're just going through it, you know, but at meet day, okay, I got to do something different. So that comes into practice. We're doing this every day, guys. There's nothing different. We're executing. Unless you run at my daughter's event, and then, you know, <laughs> do something else. Let's see. David Flint asks another question. He says, also, let's handle the green elephant in the track and field locker room. Marijuana and vaping is rampant. Coaches are staying mum on it. Concerned for under 20 developing brains and minds here. MJ is for grown brain adults was that a question uh well he just wants to i guess open the door well, to conversation around it so um he's de he's definitely letting us know you know marijuana and vaping, vaping is very big oh, okay. in the community mm -hmm. but coaches are staying quiet about it and so he's concerned for the under 20 developing brains and the minds of those uh young adults and so he's saying mary jane is for, is is for grown brain adults anybody want to speak to that that has more hands-on I mean, I don't want to speak from a, 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 a professional perspective because that's not really, I think, something that, you know, unless we have clients or directly deal with that. But in this generation with this, you know, I, I don't want to be at liberty to judge or to speak on that. If anybody else has hands on experience, not, you know, technical, but just hands on, please speak up. He did also say he's concerned about random testing and possibly some boys being kicked off the team. Well, if, uh, so, yeah. is this against the rules? Well, if it's against the rules, then your job is to implement the rules. I thought 
are we go ahead and speak to that, uh, 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 Dr. Kochoa, if you want, because unless you know, or as anybody else, I don't know if this legal or not legal. Um, you know, that's a slippery slope. And then when it comes to parenting and what they, you know, so I'm not going to, you know, go ahead. Anybody else want to touch that? I come from LA, you know, <laughs> Snoop Dogg, I'm just saying. So I'm not <laughs> one. <laughs> I didn't do it. I'm just saying, you know, anybody yeah. want to speak to that? <laughs> I can share a little bit, uh, specifically more about the substances, right? Because I, I live in Colorado and I'm from Santa Ana. So just a little bit south of LA. And, um, but I also lived in Colorado for a few years. There was that process about making it legal and illegal. And in a clinical setting, we also saw a major increase with substances, mm -hmm. marijuana and also synthetic. And right now with vaping in most schools, which mm -hmm. is becoming really normal and they can really buy it anywhere from the- um, Like a store to the- Yeah, <laughs> yeah like a store, right? Anywhere now, even through Amazon, right? So. So the, one of the biological things that is really happening is that, yes, so depending on the type of substance like marijuana and synthetic marijuana, it can be like all around her. So a lot of the times, depending on the type of, of uh, cannabis or marijuana, usually there's different levels. Some of them can help them relax, of them, others can create anxiety. So if they already have anxiety, this is actually gonna trigger more anxiety. Sure. Um, marijuana is almost like an all around their drug <laughs> that um, it, it, we don't really know what, how it's going to impact the other person. But the other problem is that with depending on a THC level, it may create hallucinations and delusions. Um, and with synthetic marijuana, a lot of the times they're just herbs and they add hallucinogens, which means they will start hearing things and seeing things or they start adding other chemicals that then at the end of the day, they end up at the hospital because they really consume other substances because they got it from the street or they don't even know where they got it from. So yes, it actually, there are studies that impacts their, uh, their nerves in their brain. I like to call it like uh, a roots of a trees. It really kind of affects their uh, nervous system in their, in their brain. So that's kind of something important to consider in regards to how to use and where to use it. I mean, if it's a college, it's a different rules and policies and it's still marijuana, it's still illegal. Um, oh, my question is, yeah, because mm -hmm. they said that they are using MJ to stress relief, but not getting counseling. And again, I think that, you know, the, the data is out there as we know, it's yeah. the discretion of their parents and, and what they are really, if these are minors, um, if they're minors and if it's illegal, then it's not a question. It's, it's just following the rules, just like they did in the NFL and in track and field, we had our you know famous Olympic 100 meter runner mm -hmm. uh, get suspended for marijuana. So there's two different dynamics here. It's the, what you believe in your culture and your upbringing, and then what is the laws that you have to you know, abide by. And I think if, you know, so as coaches, if you're asking as coaches, then you have to reinforce those rules and say, don't be selfish and don't hurt the team. And then if you're if it's a, if it's legal for your sport, then it's an ethic, ethical. And then, you know, we don't want to get in a debate, like you said, of what science and what, because that's what they're still trying to <laughs> debate. So I think that you can fall and use the rules so, sometimes as a, a guidance to help these kids say, hey, you're going to get a kick off the team if you do these substance abuse minors exact especially if they're minors then again whether it's permissible in their home and it's not permissible in the sport and then if you kind of lean on that you won't be targeted as you know being you know trying to you know judge awesome awesome thank you for that dr chalula and dr mark um our last question um oh, and we, we do have a quick question about uh about stress, but I'm going to go to go to this one up top. How do you handle when counseling, coaching and counseling happen simultaneously? For instance, a kid has a field event and does not do well, yet has more events to come, but they're dwelling on the field event and completely allows it to affect their performance later in the meet. Well, I, I'm very sensitive to this because there's a difference between coaching and counseling. And there's thousands of dollars of schooling, <laughs> hours, and education that, you know, distinguishes the difference. So even when you're a professional counselor, you're not advised to be that 
athletes coach at the same time. And when we say coach in this aspect, we're talking about life coach, business coach, career coach, or whatever coach. It's hard to be both. And, and, and as a profession, we don't recommend. So if you're that coach and this your, your, your athlete is having a breakdown of some sort, it's not your job to turn into a counselor because you're not a counselor, you're a coach. So you still have to remain a coach. It's like, um, if we're, you, you know, you don't know what you don't know and you can do more harm. Now you can console, but you know, if, if hopefully you should know by now, if your athlete has a history of anxiety or post or pre-anxiety or these other conditions and you have built-in resources available, whether technique of breathing, whatever your counselor and you have discussed and shared, but it's very dangerous because even a professional, you can't be, it's not welcome to be someone's therapist and coach. They just did the two different and they should be kept separate. So um, I think that at that time, you should just remain a coach because you don't want to be responsible for anything else that happens legally if they do bodily harm or, you know, go some and do something that is uncharacteristic and unhealthy, then, then you, you might be accused of aiding in that because subconsciously you didn't know what you were saying or, you know, able to handle that. So have resources, unless they're your child, which is a different story. Right, right. Well, this has been amazing. I, know that we have had lots of questions, lots of conversation around mental health and the athlete. Tara Ryan says, I would love to see some guidance started at the younger ages of teaching about youth stress and the positive impacts of stress, how our body responds to stress. Um, Do you have this in your book, Dr. Mark? It would be, it would help parents to hear this too. I know I teach on youth stress and distress um, in school and with my clients. Um, do you talk about this in your book? Uh, not a whole chapter, maybe a half a chapter, but not probably the attention that it deserves. Um, but we will touch on this the next uh, workshop or seminar that we will give. We'll be more specific and, and some um, um, programs and, and, and that you could implement because everything is conditioning and a problem is you have to be consistent with it. And I think that, you know, we should have these type of uh, programs mandatory with coaches and whatnot, because you see most children and co- athletes, you know, reflect on our, our reflective of their coach. It starts at the leadership. And you guys know it, you've been to events and you see the athletes out of order. Then you look at the coach and you say, I can see why. And vice versa, rarely do you see wild. I mean, look at the major sports out there. It speaks for itself. So I think if we have a program that um, is with, you know, that, that speaks to the personality of the coach, then the kids, you know, one way or the other, you know, you coach <laughs> one way or the other, you, you get along or you maybe this might not be the place for you. Right. Speaking of which, it's 521, my time. I got to go to work out. Yes, we are. I have to go yell at my kids. I mean, I got to go. (laughs) Did I say that? You you have to go coach the kids. Coach, yeah. If they have any questions, if they have any questions, have them email you. Um, We'll give everybody who registered. I think I put my email down and we can put your your resources and dock your resources. And then we can maybe all collaborate. Email me again and then we can have some more questions and ready answers to your questions ready for the next time dealing specifically with the athletes and how we can help them grow to be, you know, uh, champions on and off the field. Yes, yes, absolutely. We will, what we will do is we will send out an email um, with the recording, with the link to the recording of tonight's uh, event, tonight's episode of uh, Grind and Goal. And we'll also have email uh, emails where you can email addresses where you can send questions 
for next week's episode, um, Dr. Chalula Jackie White does say, thank you. Parents may not be knowingly the problem, but certainly not helping. Having someone else approach it would be better for the athlete and the family. And so we'll notify the school. So we are very, very grateful for everyone coming on here tonight. Dr. Chalula, thank you for your insight, your input. Thank you, Dr. Mark, for topping us off, capping us off for this series that we're going to be uh, starting. Um, we want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Please be on the lookout for the next email and you will know the episode date and time for tonight's episode and episodes going forward. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I hope that you have an amazing night and we will see you next week or another uh, next week or in two weeks or in two weeks i keep saying yeah. next week in two <laughs> weeks yes <laughs> two weeks and we hope you have a great night and love yourselves yeah. take care guys be well <laughs>